Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my second talk is about biceps tendinopathy, another very controversial issue. And my talk's outlines are anatomy and function of the biceps and what is tendinopathy, what causes tendinopathy in the athletes, and diagnosis and treatment. First, anatomy and function of the biceps. As you know, the biceps, long head of the biceps crosses across the sh uh, shoulder joint and also the elbow joint. So this muscle has function to both joints, shoulder and elbow. And uh, when the long head of the biceps tendon enters into the bicipital groove, this part is uh, stabilized by the coracohumeral ligament and the SGHL. And also the long head of the biceps is stabilized by the transverse humeral ligament. But in most of the cases with a, a complete dislocation of the long head of the biceps, this ligament is still intact. So in those cases, uh, this ligament does not function as the stabilizer to the, to the biceps tendon. This ligament is composed of two layers, one superficial, thin layer, and the deep, uh, thick layers with the fiber coming from coracohumeral ligament, subscap, and supraspinatus. And the interesting thing about this ligament is it contains free nerve endings in both layers, particularly near the tuberosities. There's no mechanoreceptors. This suggests that uh, put this ligament is a potential role as a shoulder pain generator. And also, if you look at the tendon itself, there's a neurofilament immunoreactive fibers, the pain receptors, making a network inside the tendon. And this neural network is most predominant in the proximal part of the tendon and the least predominant in the distal part of the tendon. So these are the reasons why the lung of the biceps is called the pain generator. What about vascularity? In most of the cases, uh, they have this pattern, uh, two vascular territories, one coming from the lanoid side, one coming from the muscle belly side, and there is a certain hypovascular area about one, two, three centimeters from the glenoid origin. And in 14% of the cases, they have a mesotenon and another vascularity. So in this type of a, a case, there are three vascular territories and there are two hypovascular zones. But most of the cases have this pattern. And this may be re related to the degenerative tear of the long head of the biceps. In normal tendon of the biceps, it's the widest at the origin from the glenoid. But if there is a rotator tear, then it becomes thick and wide, especially at the entrance into the groove. So if this happens, it may stuck into the entrance of the bicipital groove. What about the function of the biceps? It has both a uh, function to the elbow and to the shoulder. To the elbow, it is known as the flexor, supinator, and to the shoulder, it is known as the flexor, abductor, and internal rotator. But not much is known about the function of the biceps to the shoulder joint. So using cadavers, we measured the moment arm of the bicep, long head of the biceps to the shoulder joint. It's an abductor. It's an elevator of the, of the arm. And during abduction or scaption, the elevator function is the greatest with the arm in external rotation and least with the arm in internal rotation. During flexion, the biceps function is not affected by the rotation of the arm. During horizontal flexion, the function is the greatest with the arm in internal rotation. What about the rotator function of the biceps? If you elevate the arm in the coronal plane, that means if you abduct your arm, then the biceps changes from internal rotator to external rotators. But if you flex the arm forward, then it always remains as an internal rotator. What about stabilizing function of the biceps? We apply load to the biceps, long and short heads, and then we applied force to the rotator cuff muscles to see the stabilizing function. When the shoulder is unstable anteriorly, then the function of the biceps 
is significantly greater than those of these uh, calf muscles. Also, during the arm elevation, the calf tear patient has a superior migration of the humeral head. But if you apply load to the biceps, this superior migration was uh, restricted. So it has a function as the depressor of the humeral head. So what is tendinopathy? Gus Mazaka look at the histomorphology of the long head of the biceps and the, in three pathologies like instability, tendinosis, degenerative joint disease versus control. And there was no difference in protein expression like a type 1, 3 collagen, tenacin C, or decorin. This is the alcium blue staining, which represents the uh, concentration of the proteoglycan, or which means the tendon is being degenerated. And as you see here, in the proximal part of the tendon, it has a lot of alcium blue staining or proteoglycan. That means it's uh, far more degenerated than the distal part of the tendon. Also, they look at the polarized light analysis, and the distal tendon is very well organized in terms of collagen orientation, but the proximal tendon was disorganized except in the control. And this is the uh, polarized light analysis data. In all the areas, the proximal portion of the tendon has a disorganized uh, uh, collagen fibers. We look at the tendinopathy of the rotator cuff tendon. There may be some similarity with the cuff and the long head of the biceps. You see the, the supraspinatus tendon is swollen and it causes friction with the undersurface of the acromion. The histology shows this is a control. This is a very uh, well-organized collagen fibers, but tendinopathy showed disorganization of the collagen fibers, mucoid degeneration, and some cell infiltrations. And the electron microscope shows that the uh, nucleus of the tendon cells show this type of a condensation of the nucleus, which is uh, characteristic to the apoptosis of the tendon. And we also do the tunnel staining and the SSDNA. Both of these staining show that there's a lot of apoptotic cells. And we counted the number of them. And the tendinopathy showed uh, just in between normal and the rotator cuff tears. So judging from this data, tendinopathy may be the pre-tear condition. And in the clinical field, we see the th swelling of the tendon, and eventually it goes to the tear. So the tendinopathy may be the pre-tear condition. However, sometimes the swollen of the swelling of the tendon will go away, as you, you see in this case, that after two and a half years later, the tendon is normal and no more symptom at all. So it may be a reversible change. The classification. This type ABC classification by Sladis is based on the pathology. Type A is an inflammation. Type B, instability. Type C, it's a mechanical attrition. Habermeyer uh, incorporated the instability of the tendon in terms of the injury to the SGHL or cuff tears, group one, two, three, four, and also, uh, Laurent Lafosse introduced uh, the posterior instability of the long head of the biceps. He looked at the, uh, this anterior biceps pulley, and this is the posterior biceps pulley. And with the arm in external rotation, the long head of the biceps goes anteriorly, and with the arm in internal rotation, it goes posteriorly. So he incorporated this uh, posterior instability into his classification. Now we want to know what causes tendinopathy. The biceps tendinopathy is frequently observed in patients between 18 and 35 years of age, athletes, particularly throwing athletes, or gymnasts, swimmers, and participants in contact sports and martial arts. During throwing motion, as you know, during this late cocking phase, the shoulder is abducted and maximum, maximal external rotation. During this time period, we measure the strain of the labrum, which showed the greatest 
a strain both to the superior anterior and superior posterior labrum. So this stress and strain may cause the lesion to the biceps and also during arm fraction and internal rotation, the entrance into the bicipital groove or this pulley area may impinge with the anterior superior part of the glenoid. This is called anterior superior impingement. So during this anterior superior impingement, this will da cause a damage to the pulley and the subscap tear, and eventually the biceps tendon will be unstable. That will lead to the tendinopathy. This is one a theory of the tendinopathy. How to make a diagnosis? Well, there are a lot of tests uh, reported in, in the literature, and uh, as uh, Ben Keebler uh, explained the, to us this morning, this is an uppercut test, and according to his paper, uh, in terms of sensitivity, uppercut and bear hug is the best. In terms of specificity, belly press and speed are the best. And in terms of accuracy, uppercut test is the best. And the combination of uppercut and speed is the best in terms of detecting the biceps lesion. Maybe he'll tell us later about this. But in case with rotator cuff tears, these tests are less reliable. If the long head of the biceps tendon is ruptured, then we see this Popeye deformity. What about imaging? Well, arthroscopy is uh, the gold standard, of course, and the, followed by the ultrasound or MR arthrography, then CT arthrography and the MRI. What about treatment? The conservative treatment should come first. We can use NSAIDs or activity modification to avoid stress to the biceps or physical therapy and the throwing form correction, injection of the steroid with local anesthetics into the glenohumeral joint or bicipital groove or even subacromial bursa. But no study specifically evaluated conservative treatment of the biceps disorders. Surgical treatment, there are two options. One is tenotomy, the other is tenodesis. Tenotomy is easy to perform. It's a fast procedure. No post-op rehab is necessary, but Popeye deformity appears in 70% of the cases. Sometimes muscle cramping is the problem, and the decrease in supination and elbow flexion strength. There are a lot of papers showing the strength decrease after tendon rupture. Elbow flexion, 20% decrease. Shoulder abduction, 17%. Or supination, 23%. Pronation, 29%. So if this uh, strength decrease is acceptable to the patient, then it's okay to do the biceps tenotomy. What about tenodesis? It maintains the biceps contour and biceps function, and it decreases the risk of cramping, but still Popeye deformity occurs in 25% of the cases. When you perform tenodesis, there are a lot of places you can fix the long head of the biceps tendon, intraarticular or extraarticular, which is called sub subpectoral tenodesis or tendon transfer to the short head of the biceps. This is a tenodesis of the biceps tendon to the conjoint tendon, and the 95% no tenderness, 80% good to excellent. Uh, this is the study by Lutton. They compared five patients with the tenodesis to the proximal half or upper half of the groove versus 12 patients with the tenodesis to the lower half of the bicepital groove. And the, in the upper half group, a two out of five, or 40% of them had the residual pain, but lower half, no residual pain. And then this subpectoral tenodesis comes into the literature, and the subscap, a subpectoral tenodesis may improve pain relief by removing most of the long head of the biceps tendon and its associated tenosynovium. This is uh, Gus Mazoka's report. He performed prospective series of 41 patients, and the, all the scores improved. One failure of fixation, 
but there was no residual pain. So he reported that this is a reliable and successful procedure to eliminate symptoms. Even with the classical method to fix it to the bicipital groove, there are many methods like a tunnel, interference screw, suture anchor, keyhole method. Ozale compared these four techniques and found out that the tunnel technique or interference screw are the best in terms of uh, failure load. But recently, there are several reports showing that the failure cases at the early stage, if you use the uh, interference screw, the failure occurs at the junction of the tendon and the screw. So they recommended that the variation in techniques to protect the graft may help minimize the potential problems like increasing the graft strength or downsizing the screw or creating a smoother transition at the tunnel site. This is our surgical outcome, 30 patients, 27 months follow-up, 27 underwent tenodesis, three tenotomy. No fixation failure so far, and the residual pain was observed in one case out of 27 tenodesis, so it's uh, just uh, a little less than 4%. I think it's not too bad. So tenotomy or tenodesis, which is better? There are two review papers published in the literature, and the conclusion is Popeye sign is uh, worse in tenotomy group. This is, of course. But the muscle strength is almost equal or a little better in the tenodesis group. But we really don't know which is better. So tenotomy or tenodesis. Tenotomy is recommended for older patients with sedentary lifestyle, obese arms, you cannot see the Popeye sign, or those not concerned with cosmesis. On the other hand, tenodesis is recommended for young active patients with high physical demands or thin arms or concern for cosmesis. But the problem is the lack of high quality studies. So the Frost, these authors recommended more high-quality, well-designed, prospective, randomized control studies. I personally think that the long head of the biceps has function to the shoulder and to the elbow. If you perform tenodesis, then you sacrifice the function to the shoulder, but you can still keep the function to the elbow. If you do tenotomy, you sacrifice the function to both joints. So I still believe tenodesis is better than tenotomy. So in summary of my lecture, there are neural networks in the tendon and, the, and in the transverse humeral ligament. And the biceps is a mover and stabilizer of the shoulder. Combination of uppercut test and speed tests are useful, and the conservative treatment should be applied first. And the surgical treatment, uh, still it is controversial and we need more high quality studies. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>